In this video, we are going to discuss general formulation of plasticity for small strain problems. Uh, the reason why I want to discuss plasticity in general for small strains is to show you how the incremental relations are going to affect uh, the final results in a problem which includes plastic deformation. Now, prior to yielding, many materials are going to be almost linear or show elastic response. That means if we know the elastic constants of any material, we will be able to calculate the stress or the strain at the end of the load history uh, for the linear portion. However, when yielding occurs, then the load, the deformation, as well as the str stress results become non-linear because they are actually history dependent. They are not just non-linear based on how the stress behaves because of the change in deformation, but also how the load is applied. That means the response starts uh, depending upon the non-linearity of the material that is uh, uh, used as well as the time or let's call this the load history that is applied on the structure itself. So the final state of stress and deformation can be determined only when you account for the history of the stress and strain through the loading history as well. So in the calculations, history is taken into account by formulations in the way of relating increments of stresses to increments of strain. So not a total stress or a total strain, that is fine as long as you are using uh, a condition when if there is an increase in loading, then all the components of the stress state will also change by the same factor. However, in the case of plasticity here or stress nonlinearity along with the load history, we have to relate the increments of stresses to the increment of strain and that is known as the incremental theory. In applications where an unloading process occurs, it also has to be separated from the loading phase. If you are going to use it uh, to be proportional, then we have to know uh, the history of this engineering problem that involves plasticity. Now, as a side note, we will be using the engineering definition of the shear strain, which is given as uh, gamma xy to be equal to du dx, uh, sorry, du dy plus dv dx. And in the textbooks generally where you study plasticity, they use a uh, tensor definition where you will write uh, epsilon xy to be equal to half of gamma xy but we are going to use this formulation over here okay it's not very important but just to let you know so if you start looking at the values that come out in the end you should not be confused so let's start with the incremental plasticity relations now what we have already seen in the previous video is that when we started applying a load beyond the elastic condition then the strain increments of course you have to consider this to be a vector this could be divided into the elastic strain contribution as well as the plastic component. The stress increments d sigma are only associated with the elastic component. So we can say that it is equal to the elastic modulus times the strain of the elastic component and that can be written as in terms of the total strain minus the plastic strain. Of course, in this case, the d epsilon is a 6 by 6 uh, matrix. So, sorry, it's a 6 by 1 vector in this case, uh, which is, of course, the transpose of the, the stress. So, it is going to consider the three-dimensional stress state. So, this is the general definition of the incremental plasticity uh, definition, yeah, relations. Now, what we have also studied before or have been introduced to before is that there are three essential ingredients which formulate the elastic plastic analysis. Yeah, so if I just close this off here, the three ingredients are the yield criteria. We've already looked at these uh, definitions, the flow rule, as well as a hardening rule. And for any good uh, description, we have to take care of all the three of them. So what I want to do now is I want to spell out each of these in terms of the incremental plasticity relations for you so that we can make a link to how it works in the nonlinear finite element analysis. Now let's look at each of these terms one by one. 
The yield criteria, as you can imagine, is going to relate the stress of uh, the state of stress to the onset of yielding. Right? So that's something we already know. That means if I have to write something about the yield criteria over here, then I can say that the d sigma is go it's going to relate the to the to the stress to the onset of yielding. And we've already looked at something called the yield function, which we will bring it back into the equation. Uh, right after this. Now the flow rule on the other hand is going to relate the state of stress to the corresponding increments of the plastic strain. So this is how the material will actually flow under the plastic action. That means we are going to relate the stress to the increments in the plastic condition. Yeah? And finally the hardening rule is going to describe how the yield function or the yield criteria let's say which let's not write it as f over here, but we say, okay, the yield criteria is going to change. So the delta in the yield criteria that happens or modification that happens by straining beyond a certain point is defined by the hardening rule. And this only happens after yielding has occurred. So if the yield function that we have looked at before, which was f, let's call this again the yield function, f can be written as a function of three terms which is the state of stress, a term alpha and a term wp which you have seen before. Then alpha and wp are the terms that are going to describe how the yielding behavior changes which means they are related to the hardening response of a material under plastic strains. Now we have already seen the um, yield, uh, yield function relation for a uniaxial uh, state of stress before. So we already estimated that if f is equal to 0, then we are at a condition of yielding. If f is less than 0, then it's in the elastic state. And a condition of f greater than 0 is impossible to achieve physically. So that means when f is greater than 0, then the plasticity will occur which means the alpha and the wp will affect the way the material will behave or the structure will behave according to the hardening rule. Now if there is for example a yield surface uh, in a two-dimensional uh, state of stress so we call this sigma 1 and sigma 2 let's say you have a certain yield surface which looks like this then during plastic flow the stresses are always going to remain on the yield surface, right? So it always has to stay on the yield surface, which means that there is going to be a change in the alpha or in the WP. However, the stresses will always remain on the yield surface, whether it's a new yield surface or the same one as I have drawn here. That means we can easily say that when plastic flow occurs, we can introduce a new condition over here, which means which which is the change in the yield function df is equal to 0 when uh, there is uh, um, the stresses that are going to remain on the yield surface, right? So during plastic flow, df is equal to 0. And the moment we start unloading the structure, we are going to push the force uh, stresses back inside the surface, inside the yield surface, which means that df would be less than 0. So this is a condition. In the first case, it signals plastic flow and the second case, it signals return to an elastic behavior. So these are the uh, basic uh, definitions of what you need to take care of in terms of plasticity. So let's start, lo let's look at both the conditions of the flow rule as well as hardening rule separately so that we can understand how they fit into the finite element conditions. Let's look at details uh, of the flow rule first. The flow rule, of course, as I have mentioned, is going to relate the state of stress to the corresponding six increments of the plastic strain in a 3D behavior. The, three, the flow rule can be stated in terms of a function, which can be given as Q. This function, it has the same unit as stress, and it is also called as the plastic potential. It, is, it includes, uh, the flow rule therefore includes a scalar which is called the plasticity multiplier 
which I will introduce into the relation for the plastic strain. So the plastic strains can be written as a change in the plastic potential with respect to the stresses times a scalar which is given as the plastic multiplier. For the different uh, directions you would have for this case the epsilon x and then you would have this in terms of q sigma x and then you would have y and you would have y over here etc. So this is how the flow rule is uh, defined in terms of this function called the plastic potential. We leave it at that. The next one is the hardening rule. The hardening rule is a very interesting one because it also gives you a better understanding of how the yield surface is going to change in terms of plasticity. Now we have already discussed before that hardening can be either modeled as isotropic or it can be modeled as kinematic. Now both of these terms actually should mean something to you. Either hardening can happen isotropically or it can happen kinematically or it can happen together as well. Now isotropic hardening in the first place, so let's look at isotropic hardening, can be represented by plastic work which is done per unit volume. So we've already looked at this term WP before and that defines the isotropic hardening behavior. So this is the plastic work per unit volume which describes the growth of the yield surface. Now if you want to consider this mathematically then you can write WP to be equal to the integral of the stress with the change in plastic strain. So of course it's also related to the flow behavior but it defines the growth of the yield surface. Now I will show you in terms of diagram what I mean by growth of an yield surface in a minute. On the other side let's look at kinematic hardening and for kinematic hardening we can say that it represents translation of a yield surface in the stress space. So it is represented by a vector which is given by alpha and this alpha is going to give you a translation of the stress uh, yield surface within the stress space which can be three dimensional of course. And kinematic hardening can be defined as a integral of a certain matrix C with the change in plastic strains. Now in this case C can be defined by using the uh, plastic modulus that we have seen before given by HP with these terms. The C uh, diagonal matrix does not become a unit matrix because we as I already explained to you we generally use the definition engineering definition of shear strain rather than the tensor definition and that's why we still have the half in there otherwise of course if you use the other definition it becomes unit. But this is the basic definition of the isotropic hardening and the kinematic hardening. So definition wise it's fine but now let's look at the um, uh, behavior that I was talking about for isotropic as well as for kinematic. If I have a 2D stress space which looks like this and we, we apply a certain kind of a isotropic hardening then I could have this stress state to change in a way that it increases or decreases in size and this is the growth behavior. That is isotropic hardening. At the same time my stress state could also grow and move or translate in the stress space and that is defined by the kinematic behavior. So this is in general a very simple explanation uh, graphically of how isotropic and kinematic hardening work.